What up, though? It's your boy M. Dot Taylor, and I just jumped off the porch with Dirty Glove Bastards. <laughs> All right, we got M. Dot Taylor jumping off the porch with us today. What up, though, bro? Thanks for having me, fam. No problem, man. How I feel to be here? You know what? This is my first time in the A. I always want to come to Atlanta, straight up, but my journey just took me to different parts of the world, you know? But I'm glad to be here, straight up. No, that's real. It's a pleasure to have you in the city with us. Thanks for having me, King. How I feel to be in the city? What you been getting into since you've been here? Shit, man, I ain't gonna lie. I, I got, just got here today. Um, I locked in with Zaytoven. Um, we got some plans and shit put down, put down for tomorrow. And, you know, I, I just wanted to prioritize y'all for the day. No, that's real. We Straight appreciate up. that. No doubt. So how does it feel going to city after city, just pursuing your dreams? You know what? It's really, I'm not just going to cities like with, without intention. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to cities that's receptive of my sound and just want to know my message, you know? Cities that welcome me to come in and sit down to ask the questions, that's the type of time I'm on. So all cities that just been open just to just sit down with me, interview me, and just talk to me, you know, I've been down for that. That's, and that's real. what it's about. That's real. No doubt. What can you tell us about the culture and the way of life of Detroit, Michigan? I mean, we get all four seasons, you know what I'm saying? So you get four different types of hustlers. You get winter, spring, summer, fall, you know, wintertime hustler, is somebody who's really committed to going out and being successful. You know what I'm saying? Because people aren't outside. Uh, it's cold. It's snow outside. It's, it's extremely dangerous temperatures. It's, the, uh, the grounds is slippery. So for a person to be outside trying to get to it, they just committed and dedicated. And they want it all. You know, the springtime hustler, the hustler that want to do as much as they can before summertime. You know what I'm saying? The fall time hustler, they want to hustle as much as they can so they ain't got to be outside for winter. You know what I'm saying? So Detroit, you get four different types of hustlers. You get to see different perspectives, four different perspectives, people who want to get it in four different types of ways. That's so, real. No, that's real. So that's Detroit. How would you describe your upbringing in your childhood? Um. I mean, to be honest, bro, my upbringing, my childhood, I grew up with a bunch of motherfucking cousins, man. Straight up, I had a lot of cousins, and we all, for some reason, even though all our mamas and daddies had houses, we was all at granny crib. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's real. Straight up, we was all at granny crib. Shout out to Lil Dirk. That song that he did, that's it, Touch Home with a nigga. A song called Granny Crib, because without granny, you know, that, that's the, the nervous system of everything that's really operating around the spouses of granny. Auntie dropping her kids off over there. Mom dropping her kids off over there. Shit, even the kids' daddies and them dropping the kids off over there sometimes, you know what I'm saying? Because they know granny is operating in the grounds that get everything done, bro. So that's, just, that's just how I grew up, and that's just what everything was for me, bro. What type of kid would you describe yourself as coming up? A leader. I was the oldest grandson on my grandma's side. I mean, on my mama's side. So it came with a lot of responsibility because all of my aunties and uncles, they had a lot of boys. You know what I'm saying? They had some girls too, but they had a lot of boys. But I still had to be a leader for those boys, more so than the girls, because my aunties, and their moms, you know, they was there. You know what I'm saying? They, they held everything down. But for those boys, when, our, when they pops was out there in the field and doing what they do, they had to have a stern mentor there. You know what I'm saying? And now that they all grown, still got to hold that shit down. No, Being a leader. That's just what my childhood was. That's real. Leadership. At what point would you say you realize the streets of Detroit can get ugly? <sighs> um, that's a great question, bro. It's like, I want to give the best answer to you because of the experience of when I was able to really decide on how I was going to move based off of what was going on. But if we're just going to talk about the nitty gritty of when I, when I really seen that it was real, it was at a young age when I, didn't, when I wasn't able to make no decisions and choices for myself. You know what I'm saying? I got to see 
evictions was real. I got to see murder was real. I got to see prison time was real. I got to see jail was real. You know what I'm saying? Prison time and jail time, that's, that's different to me. Prison time is long stretches. Jail time is in short spurts. When you count on somebody, they taken away like that and they gone for a little bit of time, but not as long as somebody that's in prison. You know what I'm saying? So that's what it was for me. That's real. At what point would you say you had to go ahead and mature and jump off the porch due to the fact that you lose your mother? Um, my mother passed away December 1st, 1999 from AIDS on World AIDS Day. So before my mother transitioned and left this earth in a physical form, she always kept it real with me at a younger age. So it just like life felt different for me early. I had purpose earlier and it's like, not to say nobody else had purpose early, but a lot of time us as parents and those of us that got kids, you know what I'm saying? We know that we trying to shield them and keep them with their innocence and preserve their innocence for as long as we can. You know what I'm saying? But my mama understood, son, I'm not gonna be here that much longer. This is what's going on with me. This is, I need you to look this up. But before you look it up, I wanna tell you about it because I want you to research it so you can understand what it is, but I'm gonna tell you about it. And she gave me such a deep understanding, it just felt like I, I felt like a grown ass man as a, as a young man, because it's like, damn, it ain't no time to waste and play around. My mother can be gone any day. So I lived my, life, my, my young life like that. And being a leader was important to me. You know what I'm saying? Because of those reasons, knowing that mom is gone and if we don't got shit together and we don't look like a unit that can conduct and take care of themselves and be self-sufficient as a unit, they're gonna break us up. They're gonna send you here, they're gonna send you there, they're gonna send you there, and they ain't gonna worry about that. They just know that, all right, they was able to disperse and find somewhere for everybody to go, even though we all needed to be together, so. What type of impact would you say that had on you, your mother leaving you with such uh, at the time, you know, it wasn't much information, you know what I mean? Like, what was that for you? You know what? I'm going to be real with you, man. Communication is the most powerful source on the planet. And I say that because I felt like I was prepared when my mama transitioned to go to the other side and wasn't here with us physically because of the layers and the levels of communication. She didn't give me everything at once. She gave me certain things in certain times, let me digest it, let me tell it back to her over a week of time, two weeks of time, a month of time, that I really understand it. And before I was able to do that, you know what I'm saying? Like she wouldn't go to the next layer without making sure I understand the first thing that she gave me, you know what I'm saying? Straight up. So, and, and then I got to actually physically see mama break down and go through what she was going through. And I had to be strong there in the moments, man. You know what I'm saying? Like that shit do something to you that you can't really prepare yourself for. Watching somebody you love break down right there and they're not even in control. They're not breaking down because they're tired or something like that. It's just the way the body and the mind works. It's disintegrating. I got to see all of that. So it made me a leader. It made me want to be in charge. It made me want to shield the people I love and give people the understanding of what somebody that we love that we couldn't see our life without is about to go through the journey that they're about to take. You know what I'm saying? And hearing it from your siblings or somebody that used to change your diapers and things like that, it feels a lot easier instead of just coming from somebody that you don't really know. No, I feel that. <clears throat> How did life change after that moment, after losing your mother? You know what? We was already, before, before mom passed away, she was already in hospice. Shout out to hospice care because they did a tremendous job of just keeping her comfortable and like, keeping somebody comfortable from death. I don't even know what that means or really feels like, but they did it. She stayed there and my mother went out with grace. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm sure that it was some pain on the interior of her, but she went out with grace and 
just growing up like that with that level of responsibility on you, you had to man the fuck up. So I was ready for that. My daddy was a tremendous mentor, even though he was in and out of the prison system. It was the small moments with my father where he just kept it so real with me. And I appreciated that shit. And it had the largest impacts on me as a young man, even in his absence, even in my mother's absence. Like, I feel like, what would my father do? Would he be disappointed in me? What would my mother think? Would she be disappointed? As long as my mother, if I consider my mother and father first, and then I consider God, it's like I'm protecting my soul because of, you're supposed to keep God first and think what he thinks anyway. But if you got two solid mentors and you don't want to disappoint them and they're nowhere near on the level of God, you know what I'm saying? You can reground yourself, recenter yourself, man. And I'm not even the most spiritual nigga like that. But that's just how I conduct myself, bro. I was raised like that. I was raised in the church, but we ain't in the church seven days a week. So them same blocks, them churches is on. You got to play them blocks. When... They ain't having service. That's real talk. What inspired your decision to end up going to the Navy? Um, honestly, it was really my little brother. My little brother was the live wire in the family where it was just like, I see the direction of the plan of what people wanted to have for my brother, but I had my own concept and my own idea for my little brother. And so it's like, you know what, fuck it. Let me really recenter myself and position myself to where I can really say that I took him out the hood. You know what I'm saying? Because it's a difference of hustling in the hood, making a couple hundred thousand, moving somewhere and then saying, all right, I'll move him out here with me. But what's the contingency plan for that? You know what I'm saying? It's like the military, I was able to say, damn, I took my brother out the hood. I could claim my brother as a dependent to where I get some extra paper for him that I'm going to give him anyway. And I give him the world, you know what I'm saying? And that's, that's what it was for me, bro, being able to do that. And that's why I did it, to affect my brother's life, because he had a lot of my little cousins looking up to him. And if I can show that I can present a different lifestyle for him, then we can really affect change down the line. Straight that's up. real. How hard was it getting through boot camp? Man. Hey, man, real talk, man. So you talk about Navy boot camp, bro? Hey, this shit means something to me. So this guy right here, my motherfucking dog, AJ, man, look. We was in Navy boot camp together. I met him in boot camp. When I first met him, nobody in boot camp liked each other. We all from different parts of the slums. Because think about it. If we f from the bag, we got it figured out, and we really just can make our decisions on, in life and have our imprint and impact in life, why the fuck will we join the military? You get what I'm saying? We all join the military for our separate reasons and we all locked in after the first month because we had to realize like, damn man, this culture shock is really happening. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and that was in 2005. His nephew is right here, man. And that was, he was only four months old when I met him. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like jumping off the porch, like, and this is my first time in Atlanta. I haven't seen my dog since boot camp. You get what I'm saying? After we graduated boot camp, we went to A school. We partied in A school, then niggas got sent on their journeys. You get what I'm saying? So this is my first time in Atlanta. I got to see my brother, somebody that got longevity in my life. We always stayed in touch. Got my nephew right here straight up and this is just what it's about man longevity the shit that we talking about we really mean it we standing on it principles is being a man being uncles being father figures being nephews being brothers being cousins but being that type of role model in the right way and again man you know cameras man i'm not the most god-given nigga i'm not the most straightforward nigga i got my own mistakes man but god got me moving a certain kind of way, man, and, and we turning up, and we doing us, man. I'm in dirty glove, bastards. You, you know what I'm me? saying? Straight up, bro. That's what's it's going. a prestigious platform. Straight up. Off the motherfucking porch, nigga. So, 
talk about being in the military, yet you're doing something positive for your life, but like you're saying, you're coming from the slums and you're still losing people you care about. Man, so I can't give y'all the real reason why I really joined the military, but I say that to y'all because of the questions that you just asked me. So sometimes it's, it's subtext and things that you ask people. You know what I'm saying? Just know it's a deeper purpose for me of really seeking that change. Because I really could have turned the other cheek. Fuck it, man. Let's, let's, let's load these weapons, man. Let's move this way. Let's move this type of way, man. You know what I'm saying? Let's go against the system this type of way, man. But again, my mama and my grandma and them, they had uh, such a huge effect on me as a young nigga, man, where I'm watching them suffer and go through things and still do the best they, they can for us. You know what I'm saying? And I'm still watching all my little cousins follow me. So what kind of man would I be to not really do what's right instead of moving emotionally? That's not cool. Being emotionally inclined to something and being spiritually inclined to something are two different feelings. I was spiritually inclined to doing what's right for my family and for the young niggas that look after me, the young queens that look after me. The example that needs to be in their life so they can see that and accept that. You know what I'm saying? And then I got tremendous role models, leaders that I look up to, people that gauge me and keep me on the right track. My manager, he and G, my big brother, Fetty DeMarco. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just people in my life that keep me grounded and keep me rooted and help me continue to see my purpose, bro. And it just feel good. So it don't feel like work. That's real. How much of a fate did it have when you once your father passed away mm. and your cousin passed away? Whew, man. Mm. This green tea, by the way, y'all, so y'all know I'm, I'm cleansing my portal. You know what I'm saying? But um, when my cousin Jason passed away, I felt like I lost the next step that I was, the, not just the next step. Let's say I'm on a, I'm on a walk and in order for me to get through that door over there, I gotta walk from here to there. I felt like when my cousin Jason passed away, where that blue line is right there, I feel like after that blue line, the ground was gone. So I really had to rebuild myself up and figure out how I could step on solid ground and still hold down his legacy. And not only what he meant to me, what he meant to our motherfucking family, because he was one of them ones. He wasn't somebody that just left the earth with, without purpose and without impact or impression on the world. You know what I'm saying? Kind of like Nipsey was to his family, like Pac was to his family. My cousin Jason was that to us, like on that level, that deep, that level of magnitude. Straight up. He understood my mama was sick early. My mama died from AIDS on World AIDS Day. He understood that shit long before I could even understand anything. And he took it on himself to continue to come and get me and keep me around them and show me what it's like to be a young man. Show me what it's like to eventually be a young king. Show me what it's like to understand that hatred in the world is real. You get what I'm saying? It's like, it's different people in your life. Some people shield you from shit and some people will take you to the fire and they won't put you in it, but they're gonna take you there and they're gonna show you what that shit is and what it do. And he was that for me. So when I lost him, you know what I'm saying? It's like, damn, man, like, I wasn't prepared for that because he was died, he, 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 he left from a murder. He didn't leave from natural causes or something like that, like my father, like my mother. And my grandma, you get what I'm saying? When you lose some, somebody like that, an icon or staple in your family, it affects you differently, you know what I'm saying? But thankfully he kept it real with me and I knew the mission that I was on and I knew I just couldn't stop and take too much time to grieve and take away from not being a leader for the rest of them that's still looking up to us, straight up. That's real. What's one thing you want the world to know about the lost ones you lost? 
it, it ain't no difference from other people that lost the loved ones, lost the loved ones that they lost because we love them. Shit, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm if you lose somebody in your family that you love, that you grew up with, I'm not gonna feel it the same, nigga. I didn't get the whoopings with y'all. We didn't get the punishment together. You know what I'm saying? We didn't go get the shoes we liked together. We didn't go to the parties together. We didn't pull the girls that we slept over at each other's house tonight. Eating each other nights and talked about, you know what I'm saying? It affects us differently. You know what I'm saying? And you just gotta know and be respect respectful and understand that when people suffer loss, man, you just gotta be genuine to them too, man. Cause some people will snap after experiencing loss. Not everybody just gonna take a loss and just take that loss. Some people, some people will feel like, damn, I lost this person. I want to go do something. You know what I'm saying? And I just want to be the person that affect change and show people that when you lose somebody, man, it's a procedure and a specific method that us as a people should utilize so we can mourn properly and get over that loss without really tearing ourselves down and destroying your future. How would you say you discovered your passion for music? Shit, like I said, man, I, I grew up with a, a grandma being a, a preacher, you know what I'm saying, with aunties being, being preachers, and my mama being sick was really the most signifying, motivating, motivating force for me, because it's like, damn, at a young age, she told me really young that what was going on with her, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, damn, mama. You couldn't wait a couple more birthdays for me to, to get that conversation. But no, she let me know early. So I really didn't have no margin of error, no time to waste and bullshit around. Because I knew I was going to be going in the system if I didn't get shit right and get it together. And thankful to my mama for telling me that early and preparing me to be a man and stand on my motherfucking word, man, because it prepared me to be the father that I am today the cousin that I am, the uncle that I am, the mentor that I am today. You know what I'm saying? It definitely helped me in life, straight up. That's real. No doubt. What would you say is the overall message in your music? I ain't gonna lie, man. The overall message in my music, message in my music, it's different, bro. Like, I'm like Drake with the music, bro. Like, you gotta really listen to each song. Each song gonna have different messages in it. You know what I'm saying? And I make music with purpose. I never record a song or put out a song that's full of lies or full of shit that I don't stand behind. That's not me. You know what I'm saying? Drake is one of my favorite artists. You know what I'm saying? And he does it right. He gets it. You know what I'm saying? He gets it, bro. He, he, he caters to the new generations each year. He gives them a jewel that they can level with and they can dig into his catalog. You know what I'm saying? As long as he got them jewels in his catalog that feel good to him, he can continue to make the messaging music, the commercial music that he make. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, shout out to Drizzy. You know what I'm saying? He got that shit figured out. For sure. What would you say is the most important thing you want from your music career? I want to show people that creative freedom is the coldest nine to five of all time. You ain't gotta work for nobody. You can work for yourself and put out the right things to the world and people can be receptive of it and people can respect your service and your contribution to the culture of life, the culture of hip hop, the culture of R&B, the culture of jazz, pop, whatever the walk of life that you live in your truth in, like you really can be a contribution to that and you can be your own boss. You can be self-sufficient and you can Get shit done and have your imprint on the, in this world. And I don't, again, I'm, I'm giving that point again right now because I went to Martin Luther King's house today. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? I flew in there to Atlanta today and one of the first places I wanted to go was there. I went over there, I soaked up some jewels from some elderly, the game was incredible. And that's just what I want to give back to the world continuously. It just highlighted my purpose and what I feel like I'm here for anyway. 
That's so real. my music is just designed to be your own fucking person, stay motivated, and boss the fuck up, man. Straight up. Because they don't like that. They don't like that when you do that. They don't like that when you can put somebody else in position to take care of their family. They don't like that when you can say, you know what, I, I want to spend more time with my family for this next month. How about I up your pay and allow you to run this facility, this situation, while I take time away to be with my family? You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the type of shit that we need to be on. Well, we got people that saying executive positions to help people level up and boss up. Because I'm not going to be mad at that individual for using that reference moment and that period when themselves was really good to leave, to start their own. That's what this shit is about. Because that's a reference for you. Hey, when you come work for me, this is the limit for you. You can be your own boss. You can run your own shit after being and giving a contribution back to the culture. And that's oh, what it's real. about. So talk about that. Hey, real quick, man. Shout out to you for your questions, bro. I don't know if anybody ever cut you off from asking you asking questions, bro. But the way you ask questions, bro, is comfortable. It's respectful, bro. And I appreciate you, bro. I was nervous because you asked me that <laughs> shit before we did the interview, bro. Say that. Dead. It's all Shout good, out to you, man. my nigga. No, it's all love. Straight up, bro. <laughs> They don't okay, like man. that, man. They don't like that. They don't like that, bro. So let's Straight talk about up. they don't like that remix. Oh, man. Shout out to Mozzie. Because I met Mozzie like six years before we ever even collaborated. You know what I'm saying? I'm going into one of the check cashing spots at maybe like 1.32 in the morning. You know what I'm saying? And it's like six years ago. I'm, I'm picking up a way smaller amount. <laughs> that when Mozzie and them niggas sit there picking up, but Mozzie ain't in there. I see somebody in there with a chain on that say Mozzie on it. Whole time, it's just people e Mozzie. And I'm like, damn, man. I'm like, yo, shout out to that nigga Mozzie, bro. I got love and respect for him. But keeping in mind, it's late at night and Mozzie in the car. I, don't, I didn't know Mozzie in the car. And he see me walking into the spot. He knows people in there to pick up some paper. It's in L.A. They from the Bay Area. You know what I'm saying? Mozzie eventually walk in there. I didn't even know Mozzie was standing behind me. You get what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm shouting out Mozzie. And my nigga Mozzie say, fella, fella. I turn around. Damn, Mozzie back there. You know? I didn't want to pick up the amount of money that I was picking up. <laughs> At that moment, straight up. Go back there, tap in with my nigga. I'm like, yo, I know you're doing your thing, bro. Let me get your manager number just because I don't want to interrupt what you got going on because I'm def I definitely wasn't on that level of what he was on at that time. You know what I'm saying? And nigga gave me his manager number, tapped in with them, and every holiday we just kind of all stayed in touch. I seen that nigga Mozzie again some years later, and he's just like, man, come on, man, when we going to collab? I sent them three records. They don't like that was one of the records I sent them. Put that shit out. My nigga Mozzie get locked up. Damn. So it's like, I wanted to kind of keep that energy going for the record because DJ Charisma, Detroit, DJ Gifted, like it was a lot of DJs playing that shit on the radio, in the clubs. It was giving us traction and moment, momentum. And then I dropped it on my birthday, you know what I'm saying? So it, it just felt good. You know, Jim Jones and them camp, it was just a, a lot of good energy towards the record. And then I wound up going on tour to the Bay Area and I bumped it to Mr. Fab. Mr. Fab, like, yo, man, fuck with me, man. Send me something. Let's get something done. And I'm just like, you know what, man? I just felt like it would be special for Mozzie to take the record that we got to put that same energy and the respect that I have for him on steroids. Because in the Bay Area, they love Mr. Fab. You know what I'm saying? And everywhere that I went on tour, they talking about Fab. So I put Fab on the record. I sent that nigga the song. And he sent the verse back in 30 minutes, bro. That's wild. Sent me, King Chip the song. He sent me the song the next day. It was just destined. I had my brother Fetty DeMarco on the song. My dog B Free on the song. And my manager like, look, man, we got too many verses on this, man. We got to cut it down. You know what I'm saying? So we just wound up putting out the remix with me, Mozzie, Mr. Fab, and King Chip. But I do got an extended version coming out with my other niggas because I ain't going to waste their verses because them niggas killed it too. 
No, that's real. <laughs> Straight up. I love my niggas, man. So when can the fans expect another project? You know what? I'm going to drop an EP, subtitle, I am M. Taylor. And after I drop the EP, I want my album to be called the same thing. Just because I want them to be focused on the mission in here. We're going to drop visuals that's on another level. We're going to do things that not everybody is doing. Straight up. You might have seen something that we're doing with somebody before, but again, it's not watered down or oversaturated. Sure. It's respectful and it's within the taste that people are going to appreciate. Straight up. So besides music, what else you working on right now? We're doing short films. I got a film called Long Way From The Basics. And, um, I don't even want to break the ice on that, man. It's just a, it's a beautiful thing, man. The culture is definitely going to feel it. They're going to feel it. The way that we come in with that, man, the way that the production is, the way the post-production is, it's, it's a beautiful thing, man. Executive produced by Ice-T, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm thankful. I, I got a film school background. I went to the L.A. film school. That's how I was able to meet Ice-T, you know what I'm saying? And I just want my visuals to be next level. I don't want everything to be guerrilla style. Fuck that. No, that's real. No doubt. So what's some of the best game I see ever gave you? Don't go out your way for anything that look good to you. If we going this way, you see a bad bitch over here, and she over there standing by herself and even looking vulnerable, and you feel like you can mack her down. Why are you going out your way to go over there? Why are you going out your way to save a homie? Why are you going out your way to do anything that's away from what your purpose is? At a certain time in life, you gotta understand what your purpose is. And once you understand your purpose, you gotta run that bitch down. And if anybody love you and respect you and they know that you're moving purposefully, they will never be upset at you for not being able to help them with their minuscule peon ass problems, bro, while you moving with purpose. Shout out to the big homie Ice T. That's real. Straight up. Any last words and shout outs? I mean, shout out to uh, Final Level Music, Fetty DeMarco, uh, Namek, Six Easy, Hen G, Ice T, Daniel Peter, uh, Mo Taylor, man. Shout out to my nephew right here, man. Come on, man. Give him your shit. I'm you on the porch. Hello, man. Get back, baby. AJ, yeah, man. where can they find you at? Yo, good GSMG vibes, man. Shout out to my lactation, Ashley, you know what I'm saying? Shout out to God for giving us this moment. Straight up, shout out to the streets for being receptive of our sound. Shout out to my nigga Mozzie, Mr. Fab, King Chip, the producer, Chef Maid. Shout out to my brother Clyde Strokes, Jimmy Dukes, Jimbo Wham, all my producer family, man. I love all y'all. I ain't got enough time to shout all you niggas out, but we off the motherfucking porch with it. Shout out to motherfucking Dirty Glove Bastard. Dang. Straight up, we here. Yeah. For sure. I know, I know, I know they don't like that. Double up my check and double ride back. I know, I know, I know.